final reading this morning comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, beginning in verse 15 and going to the end of the chapter. In this holy scripture, listen for God's word to you. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age, but in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, may your Holy Spirit grant us attentive ears and hearts this morning as we ask ourselves once again what it means to have you as not just Savior, but Lord and therefore King over our lives and all of your creation. So we offer this prayer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. It was nearing midnight on a day in late June of 2008 when I crossed the Downing Bridge for the very first time. I was driving, pretty good memory here, a silver Dodge Charger that I had rented, or rather you all had rented for me from the Richmond International Airport. And nary a moon was in the sky that night, and in the pitch black, I could not make out the beauty of the Rappahannock River. But I knew in that nearly mile and a half trek across the water that this place must be beautiful. I can't wait to see it. As I crossed over from what I later learned was the land of the Canaanites of Essex County to the land of God's people, the new Israel in the northern neck. I thought we had rivers in Texas. Waco has a beautiful river, I thought, called the Brazos that goes right by the brand new football stadium they waited to build till after I left. Compared to the Rappahannock, the Brazos is what we'd call a creek or a creek. And because of the beauty of this area, I always enjoyed going out on trips to discover new things. I was always up for an adventure. And I hadn't been here that long when Furl asked me to go visit her brother, Rody B, who had been in a car accident and was in the Naval Hospital in Portsmouth. And I remember going down, first time ever, to that uh, Hampton, Norfolk, Virginia, beach area and being fascinated by how close I was to the water and, and then on the trip back I had heard about what some people describe as a wonder of the world the 17.6 mile Chesapeake Bay Tunnel Bridge and I said well we're, we're gonna do this and what an adventure it was and I, I think some of you who have lived here your entire lives still have not made that trip if you get bored sometime in the spring and feel like you can tolerate six hours in the car with a preacher let me know and i'll take you so you uh, can have that experience now that tunnel bridge is state highway 13 and i don't know what the last warning is on that road to say 
and get off now or you're going to be on this tunnel bridge. But one thing I did remember was when I was weaving through those other tunnels to get to that naval hospital, I remember exit number 268, 268 that warned all drivers, this is your last chance, last exit before the tunnel. Last exit before you, for those of you who are claustrophobic, decide to venture into a straw made of concrete and asphalt and go under all of this water. Last chance. Last time to get off of this path. It's a choice. We all have choices. We make choices. We make decisions each and every day. And there are a couple of proverbs that butt heads with one another about what our mentality should be when it comes to making choices. There are those that say, look before you leap. And that means that we really want to weigh all of the consequences, all of the positives and negatives of the choice or the decision that we have to make before we determine uh, which way we will go. And there are others of us that hold more to the mantra or the proverb, he who hesitates is lost, which means if we, if we don't make a decision, if, if, if we don't make it in that moment, the opportunity may be lost forever. There's wisdom in both of those sayings. And depending on the way our personalities are wired, we go one way or the other. We're either the, the kind of people that when we're given the choice, we want hours if not days before we make this critical decision and there are others of us when presented with an opportunity before the opportunity has even been concluded we're like yes I'll, I'll, I'll take that I don't want to miss out on that and some of us perhaps think that we somehow can just not make the choice but there is great wisdom in the words of William James who writes when you have to make a choice and don't make it that in itself is a choice so we're always making choices, even by refusing to make a choice, we have made a choice. And depending on which one of those two groups I described earlier we're a part of, we tend to be very critical of the other group. For those of us that really like to take our time before committing, before making a decision, we think those that jump at the first opportunity, that they're behaving rashly, that they're foolhardy. And for, for those who are decisive, who make their choices, their decisions right away, they look at the other group that's weighing everything uh, back and forth and accuse them of just sort of settling into some inertia where nothing really happens. For Christ the King Sunday, I'd like to go back to, I think, one of the most important, dare I say, the most important decision that we ever make. And it's all tied into that sacrament, that symbol of baptism. And, and whether we were uh, children, teenagers, adults, or senior citizens, when we ventured into the water to receive our baptism, we were asked by the baptizer, do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And we answered either yes or I do before receiving the water that says this old life is gone and I have embraced this new life. There is a certain emotion or a feeling that can be tied to that time in our lives. Uh, we, we feel like we've been saved. We feel like there is a new start in our lives and there is a great security that comes with that. But as with everything else in life, the newness eventually fades off. And we can start to wonder, did this really make any difference at all? I think of Jesus who in Luke chapter 9 had a would-be disciple come to him and say, Lord, Lord, I, I want to follow you. I'm, I'm going to follow you, but first please let me go say goodbye to my family and then I'll be right back. And Jesus appears so harsh in that story because... <clears throat> He tells the man that anyone who has set his hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. That once you make this decision that Christ is Lord and that's where I stand, then that's the place we need to be. 
But again, as emotional beings, what happens to us over time is that we eventually feel like we've drifted back into the old life. And maybe that was just some experience and it has faded. It doesn't have the power that it used to. If that's you, I want to offer you some assurance this morning. That's not just you, that's everybody. And we have made a mistake with Christianity in America over time of telling people that you've always got to feel that way, that you've got to have that emotion that you had in that initial decision of standing in those waters and saying, yes, I proclaim him as my Lord and Savior. Life is different forever. It's especially true. Not just American Christianity, but let me whittle it down to that Bible Belt. It's fascinating to me that it looks as if my entire life is going to be spent on the two ends of the Bible Belt. It starts in West Texas and it comes all the way out to just south of the Mason-Dixon line where we are now. It is that idea that to follow Jesus means that you have to have this emotional experience. To follow Jesus means here's the list of doctrines, the list of statements that you have to believe, and if you don't line up with us exactly on these, then you're really not part of the group. And the irony of all of that that I think so many of us in the Bible Belt are blind to, and I want to see if I can not shake us awake, but at least nudge a few of us awake today. Do you not realize the kind of Christian faith that is practiced in our geographical area from West Texas to the Chesapeake Bay, that we've started to become so legalistic and narrow-minded that we behave just like the Pharisees and the Sadducees that Jesus condemned. If, if there isn't joy, if there isn't peace that can transcend the difficulty of circumstances, if there isn't generosity, if there isn't kindness, all of those fruits, those virtues of the Holy Spirit, if they're not a part of who we are, it means we've exchanged a living faith for a set of rules. And just trying to conform to what the group says we have to do so we can belong and they won't punt us out. I don't think that that is at all what Jesus intended with his gospel. Here, Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus. And this passage has some things in common with the passage we read from Philippians on Thanksgiving Eve, if you were here for that service. This, again, is another one of the four letters that Paul writes while he is imprisoned in Rome awaiting his execution, likely a beheading by Emperor Nero. And the way that Paul wrote to those Philippian Christians where we read on Wednesday evening is the same way he writes to these Ephesian churches. He's thankful for them and he prays for them even though they're undergoing difficult circumstances just as Paul is in prison. And he says the common bond that holds them together no matter what the difficulty is that they're going through is this faith in Jesus. And as he writes to them, he centers his focus on the power of God in raising Jesus from the dead. That even when Jesus' life and just like our lives sometimes seem to be headed toward the most ignoble and tragic ending, even at death, that is not the final word that God has shown through Jesus that life is eternal and by his grace and mercy has bestowed that eternal life, not just upon us as individuals who might believe this or believe that, but has bestowed it upon the entire creation. Think of Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth where he writes, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, not just that he or she is a new creation, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, there is a new creation. Everything has become new when Jesus Christ is seen as king over all of creation and therefore king and Lord over our lives. Paul concludes this first chapter 
by telling these Ephesians how important it is that they continue in the faith that has seen Christ as king over all of creation. And he implores them to understand, do you not see that the work continues through you? You are the church. And God has no, now poured his power and love out into you as the continuation of Christ in the creation. You are the church. You are the body of Christ. How will this good news, how will this gospel continue without your witness, without you continuing to live out the story? I get frustrated within our context today that uh, some churches seem to have usurped the name evangelical. Well, I'm an evangelical Christian. And within the media, that phrase has then now carried the baggage. Well, that means that you have a particular politics and it means that you have a particular theology. And to be an evangelical Christian means that you line up on all these. It frustrates me so much because I don't understand how there can be any Christian who is not an evangelical, not with all the political baggage and the theological fundamentalism that comes with it today, but how can you be a Christian unless your life is defined by the vision provided in the good news of Jesus, the gospel. And that's all evangelical means. Based upon the gospel. Based upon the good news. I'm taking that word back. Every Christian is an evangelical. For it is the good news, the gospel, that defines us whether we want to line up with their politics. And even if we refuse that awful fundamentalist theology that is so prevalent today. But the church is messy. And it's always been messy. Although I would have missed the uh, internet and a lot of other technological advantages, sometimes I think I would have been better off as a follower of Jesus in the first 300 years. When it was just little house churches, loosely connected. And you knew everyone you worshipped with and there was danger outside, but you had that family of faith and you were locked in together. This Jesus upon his throne in the heavens, he, he is our guide throughout life. But for better or for worse, eventually that organic and vibrant church became the institutional church. And as the institutional church gained power, so much of the gospel got distorted. And then as it continues in the messy story of the church, that Roman Empire eventually evolves into a Holy Roman Empire, and then all of the nation states of Western and many in Eastern Europe uh, come out of that. And it, during all of this time, the church just keeps dividing and di dividing. First, almost a thousand years ago, when the Western Christians told the Eastern Christians, get lost because we disagree with you about a couple of things. And then 500 years after that, with the Protestant Reformation and Martin Luther, the church then splintered into a dozen denominations and then into a hundred denominations today. And it can leave some of us perplexed, wondering where is the unity that was stressed, so emphasized by St. Paul. I think of Martin Luther who was facing likely execution if he wouldn't recant from some of the things that he had taught. And at the Diet of Worms, knowing that he may be speaking his own indictment and his own sentence of death, he ends his speech after saying, I'm sorry, but I'm going to let the Bible, I'm going to let Scripture be my guide, and I'm not going to let some laws that churchmen came up with be the authority. And so knowing he would face death, possibly... For taking that stand, he was spared. He speaks these words. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Because for Luther, as much of an ass as he could be at times, had Christ on his throne. And Christ was his king. And there's stories like this even in the Bible. The last Bible study we had on the Gospel of John we have all these followers starting to leave Jesus at the end of John chapter 6 because his teaching seems so radical to them. They say, this is too much. We're out of here. And Jesus looks at his own disciples and says, how about you? Are you going to stay with me? Are you going to abandon me? And Simon Peter's words resonate with me. Lord, 
To whom could we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Following Jesus is by no means easy. Following Jesus is by no means safe. But oh, my friends, it is good. And it fills life with so much meaning and purpose. It can sometimes be scary to follow this Jesus who preaches self-denial and unconditional forgiveness when we live in a culture that is so full of focusing on self-gratification and grievance. But we are called to be the humble band that continues to look up and recognize Christ on his throne. So here are some warnings on this last Sunday of the church year for us to keep in mind is checks on ourselves to see if Christ remains king in our lives. The moment we discover ourselves feeling superior to others, we've gotten lost on a detour. The moment self-pity or feeling sorry for ourselves preoccupies our minds, we've gotten lost on a detour. When more time is spent resenting and being angry at others, rather than being grateful for and serving others, we've gone on a detour. I suppose I'm asking you to take my word for this. But when you see that warning on Ezek 2.68, it says, last chance to get off, or you're stuck, stay on the path. Stay stuck. Don't take that detour. Keep going forward on the path that lies ahead, even though it may be frightening. Because what comes with it is a blessed clarity of seeing God's love and grace active in the world and seeing that we can continue to be the disciples that proclaim it and live it out each day. Amen.